Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we are streaming into week seven of our daily histories videos. If you've been hanging in there with us for the last six weeks, uh, we're gonna definitely hang in there with you as well. For you keen observers out there, you might notice something a little bit different today. Uh, today I'm in somewhat more formal attire than usual and that's because today we're going to church. In fact, we're gonna go to the Cathedral of Mary Our Queen up on North Charles Street. Um, but before we get there, we got to start downtown on South Charles Street um, and at a place called O'Neill's Department Store. Thomas O'Neill was an Irish immigrant, came to the United States in the 1860s and started a dry good business um, and did very well at it. As an aside, I was thinking, you know, some other people who came to Baltimore and started dry good businesses in the 1800s, um, George Peabody, the Peabody Institute, Johns Hopkins, of course, the hospital and university, Jacob Epstein just a week or so ago with the uh, uh, Baltimore Bargain House. I'm beginning to think that maybe Baltimore in the 1800s for dry goods was like Silicon Valley in the dot coms in the 2000s. Uh, a good time to be a dry good merchant, uh, merchant in Baltimore. But anyway, back to Thomas O'Neill. Um, his, uh, his dry good business uh, was, or um, yeah, his dry goods business department store was doing very well. Um, he actually had off, he had stores in Dublin and in London and in Paris. Um, he would stand in the doorway uh, greeting customers by name, saying something like, well, welcome, Mrs. Such and Such. I had our, our buyers in Dublin pick out a new dress, especially with you in mind. Um, and he did, did very well that way. Um, the 1904 fire came along, though, and threatened everything, at least for his uh, Baltimore uh, branch. Um, the fire was raging uh, in February in 1904, and as part of the tactic to fight it, the Baltimore Fire Department um, was blowing up buildings in the, in the path of the fire, sort of like a fire break. And uh, as the fire department rolled up, and, and of course O'Neill's department store was in the path, as the fire department rolled up with their boxes of dynamite, Mr. O'Neill was standing in his doorway and said, uh, basically, uh, if you blow up my building, you're gonna blow me up too. And we don't know exactly what the whole exchange was, but the fire department kept rolling up the street, I think probably hoping that the next building owner wouldn't be an um, irate Irishman and they could get it done. Uh, but O'Neill had two weapons that maybe the fire, part, the fire department didn't know about. The first was he had teams of employees up on his roof. They had clogged the gutters and were flooding it with water, kind of like a bathtub, so that if any embers landed, they would land in water. Uh, and they had wet blankets that they were assigned to go and uh, wipe out any embers that did land. Um, that was weapon number one. Weapon number two was he sent another employee across town to a group of Carmelite nuns and asked uh, the nuns to pray for him. Uh, O'Neill was a devout Catholic. He attended mass daily. He and Cardinal Gibbons considered each other good friends. And we don't know whether it was the wet blankets on the roof or the Carmelite nuns prayers, uh, but the fire did in fact spare O'Neill's department store. And in thanks, he pledged to give uh, his estate when he died uh, to, the, to the Catholic Church to build a cathedral. Um, O'Neill died uh, on Good Friday in 1919. Um, he did give his estate to his family, uh, his, his wife, Roberta, and, uh, and his sisters. Uh, and then with the provision that when the last of them died, it would, the money would go to the church for a cathedral. Um, the last of them to die was Roberta in the 1930s. And at that time, it was the height of the Depression um, and World War II. Uh, so the money just sat in a bank until the 1940s or early 50s. And the church at that point uh, didn't need a new cathedral. We already had one of those. Uh, what it needed were schools. And so the church actually went to court to try to overturn the will to allow them to spend money on schools, not on a cathedral. Um, the judge denied it. And by the mid-1950s, the church uh, decided that they would, in fact, go ahead and build a cathedral. And when they got to it, they were really serious about it. Um, they hired a, sh a firm out of Chicago to design it, um, well known for uh, working with Catholic institutions across the country. Um, and they were given three uh, charges of three things. They were to design a Gothic, uh, old-fashioned Gothic cathedral, a uh, sort of mid-range cathedral, um, a blend, and then a modern uh, architecture design. And the church looked at the three and chose modern, Art Deco, in fact. Um, and that's what we have today. It is a grand, grand structure. If you haven't uh, been inside, I encourage you to do it. Um, it was completed in 1959. And let me read a few statistics here. Um, it, is, uh, it is 163 feet high. 
It is 373 feet long, um, and incidentally, that's 41 feet longer than St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, uh, if, uh, if you want a little competition going on here. It seats almost 2,000 people, um, and it has 385 sculptures and 398 uh, pieces of stained glass, um, including one in a side chapel of Thomas O'Neill, the benefactor. And I'm gonna end on this note, uh, that uh, we believe that it is the, in the church, the Catholic Church's 2,000 year history, it is the only cathedral to have been uh, built with, by the benefactory of one person. All right, I think that's it for today, and we'll see you tomorrow.